Hi, can anybody hear me? It's Rolando. We hear you. All right, thank you. Good. Question, can you guys see my uh, slide uh, already or not? Yes, we can, Dr. Peralta. And are you seeing my uh, like my personal slide or the Yeah, I see the notes yes. too. Okay, let me switch this then. How do I do this? <clears throat> it's here. How about now? Yeah, we only see the slides. I don't see the notes. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Dan, if you could please just let me know whenever it's good to start. Dr. Brother, we should be good to start. I think a bunch of people have logged in and they're ready. All right, let me just mute this, thanks. <clears throat> All right, so uh, thank you very much, everybody. Good afternoon, uh, I'm Rolando. Um, thanks, uh, Dan, uh, for uh, inviting me to do this talk. Uh, I did it uh, about a year ago or so. Uh, we had a blast talking about it. So uh, I hope you guys find it useful and um, feel free to ask any questions at any point. I'll be glad to try to answer them as best as I can. So uh, we're gonna be talking about long nodules and um, it's kind of funny to think that we're going to try to summarize something so complex in just an hour, but we're going to try to do our best by uh, focusing on things that I think are really key uh, <clears throat> for our assessment uh, of patients when they're present with a long nodule. So um, I have nothing to disclose pertinent to this talk. And then the objectives are going to be, number one, we're going to assess the probability of malignancy. 
We're going to try to figure out how do we go about that. Is this patient going to be low risk, medium risk, or intermediate risk, or high risk? And then with that piece of information and some other components, we're going to decide where do we put this patient? Do we put them in the surveillance category, in the more testing or more information category, or in the treatment category? That's our, those are our objectives for today. But from a clinician's standpoint, I would say that the goal whenever you're seeing a patient for long nodules is to expedite the diagnosis of those nodules that are malignant while you're minimizing uh, any form of testing or harm to those patients who have benign nodules. Um, of course, while inflicting no physical or emotional harm to them. Okay, so that's our goal or a duty to the patient. So this is very easy, right? We're going to talk about radiology and we're going to cover which ones are benign and malignant. And then we're going to talk about management thresholds. And then we're going to talk about guidelines, Flaschner, lung rats, and then chest guidelines. And then, you know, I once, once I do all this, I end up just like that. And I have no idea what, what I'm supposed to do next. So we're going to try to make it as palatable as possible. So first, we're going to start with some housekeeping stuff. Um, I think... Most of the audience right now uh, are very familiar with uh, certain definitions and risk factors, so we're going to get those out of the way. First, what is a solitary pulmonary nodule? It's a well-circumscribed lesion. It's up to 30 millimeters because more than that is a mass. Um, and it's surrounded by normal lung, no atelectasis, no hyaluronic enlargement of no pleurifusion. The reason why this matters is because sometimes you're seeing someone in clinic who has a, I don't know, a two centimeter um, right upper lobe lesion, and they have right hyalur lymphadenopathy. Well, the assessment of malignancy on that patient is completely different than someone who doesn't have hyalur enlargement because the risk for that being malignant is much higher. So you're not comparing apples to apples there. Um, that's one thing. So 30, up to 30 millimeters, uh, well circumscribed lesion, normal lung around it, no atelectasis, no nodes, no pleurifusion. Um, Nodules that are less than eight millimeters rarely need anything else than radiologic follow-up. So don't worry too much about those. Don't, don't try to memorize what am I supposed to do with four or six millimeters because in all honesty, I don't try to memorize that because the guidelines may change. So I go to a reference chart and I look up what we need to do. So less than eight millimeters rarely needs anything else than radiologic follow-up. Don't memorize that. Uh, look at old images. I cannot stress how important this is. If you find a solid nodule, and it's been stable for more than two years, leave it alone. It's probably un it's very unlikely to be malignancy. Uh, but if it's a subsolid, uh, also known as a pure ground glass or a semi-solid, something like that, you need to verify that it's been stable for at least three years. And some guidelines even suggest five years because the growth or the volumetric doubling time of those lesions are so uh, slow that you may need more than three years. I have a little bit more on this later. But look at old images. And more importantly, more important than anything else is the comorbidities matter, the life expectancy of the patient matters, and their preferences matter. So that needs to come into the equation of what do we do with the patient. Risk factors for malignancy, we all know this, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. And then uh, radiologically speaking, yes, the size of the lesion matters. The larger, the higher risk of malignancy. The growth rate is very important, and we'll talk about VDT here soon. Borders smooth are good, speculation is bad. If it's a popcorn or diffuse, central calcification is good, central or off central laminate is bad. Upper location of a, a nodule increases the risk of that being malignant. Um, when we're talking about attenuation, we may say solid or sub solid, those are divided into pure ground glass and semi solid. Uh, and cavitation also matters, right? So, those are just things that radiologically we have to keep an eye on. We're all familiar with those. So let's talk a little, little bit about VDT, volumetric doubling time. Um, the faster, if something grows very fast, and what I mean by that is less than 20 days, this is very unlikely to be malignancy. If something grows exceedingly slow, uh, a VDT more than 600 days, then the risk of malignancy is very low, 0.8. But anything in between, somewhere about a 4 to 10% probability of malignancy. So these are the ones that are going to be much more significant for us, and more concerning to us. Now, that only applies to solid nodules. When you're talking about semi-solid nodules, then the VDTs are different on average. So for a pure ground glass, 813 days plus about a year. So for those who want to know about years, it's two years and two months on average, plus minus one year. And if it's a semi-solid, it's 
one year and four months plus minus eight. This is where the three year recommendation for semi solid nodules comes. Okay, because they have a slow growth pattern. What does this mean clinically? If you're evaluated someone in clinic for a nodule and it's a semi solid, you need to account for the longer period uh, of time needed for VDT. All right. And then uh, another thing that's really interesting, and I've talked to some fellows about this, is, you know, when we're looking at a, at a CT, uh, we're looking at a report, we're seeing diameters, but the diameters of a spheric structure um, are sometimes undermining the real growth, okay, because it's a sphere. So as the diameter changes, just a little change in diameter is going to increase significantly the volume of that lesion. So in this example here, for instance, uh, this lesion went from 10 millimeters to roughly 10 millimeters to about 12 millimeters. So there's only a two millimeter change in the diameter of that lesion. But if you calculate the volume of that, okay, that has increased for about 40%, right? That seems significant, right? And so in a period of 206 days in this particular case, it increased uh, 40%, okay? So what does that mean to us? You know, since we get reports on diameters and not volumes, what diameter increase is equivalent to a volumetric doubling time? And the answer to that is about 26%. So if you have a lesion that increases by diameter of 26%, that has already doubled uh, in, in volume. This is also important because if you see the new Fleischner guidelines and you read a little bit more uh, newer literature, uh, there's a lot more push for volumes as an assessment rather than diameters. And this is one of the reasons for that. Okay, so VDT. Uh, summary, uh, very slow rate uh, of growth uh, for a solid nodule, unlikely to be malignancy, very fast. It's likely to be infections, everything in between, uh, four to 10% uh, likely to be malignant. That's for solid and for subsolid nodules, you gotta wait a little bit longer for VDT. So um, the way we're gonna do this is, that's housekeeping uh, done. So now the way we're gonna do this is we're going to talk about pretest probability of something for being cancer, we're going to add to that the benefit and the potential harm to the specific patient. And then that is going to give us a management threshold. And that's how we're going to decide, okay, the patient gets follow-up, patient gets surgery, or patient gets something in between, okay? So the first thing is to decide what is low, what is intermediate, and what is high. And when I'm in clinic, I ask fellows this, you know, they tell me, I think the risk of malignancy here is low. And then I say, well, what is low? Are you talking 5, 10, 15% chance of malignancy? And oftentimes, it's very variable what I get as an answer, okay? Um, the good thing is that the guidelines do give us specific numbers, and these numbers actually matter uh, because it is, it is this. Um, these numbers is what we're going to use to define what we do with a patient. Low risk, less than 5% probability of cancer. High risk, more than 65, and everything in between is intermediate. That's what we have to talk about, okay? All right, so how likely is it to be cancer? We can do that subjectively, using intuition and experience, and that depends on your knowledge, experience, and biases, or you can use probability models. That depends on the clinical profile and the prevalence of malignancy in that specific population. Those are the two ways we can do that. So let's talk a little, little bit about uh, probability models. To understand that, we need to know what a receiver operating curve is and an area under the curve is. Basically, if a test has ex excellent sensitivity and specificity, uh, it's going to look pretty square here. And that means that there's, you know, it's almost 100%. Uh, it's perfect test, okay? If you have something that's 50-50, then the line is going to look like that, and that's basically chance. Okay, so in this example here, this would be chance. You flip a coin and then you figure out if it's benign or malignant. Uh, this test is a little bit better. This test is much better. Okay, that's a area under the curve. So um, this is a kind of a compiled list of different prediction models available. This is not for you to memorize. This is available on the talk for you guys to go back and and dive in a little deeper if you want to, but there are a couple of points that I want to emphasize. So number one is um, area under the curve. None of these predictive models are perfect. 
at best, they reach 94%. Um, and then, or, but most of them are around 80. Okay, so they're not perfect, but they are better than chance, of course. Then the other thing is that the prevalence of malignancy in these models is exceedingly different. All right, so if you take the Brock model, which was created uh, with um, NLST data, okay, low dose uh, CT screening patients, the prevalence of malignancy was 5.5, and that's not surprising because it's a screening population. They're not having any symptoms. They're not getting an extra or a CAT scan for a particular reason. It's just screening. So you would expect the prevalence of malignancy to be lower, as opposed to Gurney, Mayo, VA, okay, which are incidental long nodules um, uh, predictive models where the pre prevalence of malignancy is different. The that matters. And then the other thing that matters is that uh, the characteristics or the variables in each one of these uh, models might be different. Biggest difference, for instance, this models here, Gurney, Mayo, VA, uh, Brock and PKUPH are only imaging, okay, without functional studies, whereas Herder, Treat, and BIMC incorporate a PET-CT. This means that if you have a PET-CT available, then you should not be using probably one of these. You should be using one of the ones that include a PET-CT. And then you also have to uh, kind of have a general idea for what are the risks or the, sorry, the variables that go into each one of them. Most of them include age, smoking history, location of the nodule, size, things like that, okay? So uh, let's play a little bit. I, I love this uh, slide when I, or, or this actually article when I read it, because it, it puts real world perspective into specific cases. So we have several models up top, okay? And then we have patients um, and the y-axis. So first uh, case is a, 53-year-old lady, she's a former smoker, 10-pack year history, quit many years ago at 15. No emphysema on uh, imaging. And it's a smooth right lower lobe, 1.2 centimeter nodule. And it is hypermetabolic by PET-CT with an SCV max of 3.3. Depending on which one you use, you're going to get different numbers. So the, the end result was a necrotizing granuloma in this particular case. But as you can tell, yellow are the ones that were determined to be intermediate by that model and red is the one that's high risk. So Gurney assumed high risk or high probability. All the other ones really didn't change that much. They were all intermediate. Even within the intermediate, there's significant variability as you can tell, okay? But what matters is that this one, by guidelines, you would have sent to surgery, okay? Resection, some form of treatment. This one's you would have gotten more information. So depending on which one you use, you're gonna get different risk for malignancy. In this particular case, probably using the Herder model is better or the treat of BIMC because it has a PET-CT. <clears throat> if it didn't have a PET-CT, probably the Mayo would be fine. Next case, 69-year-old man, former smoker, 38-pack year history, quit 20 years ago, emphysema radiologically, irregularly shaped, left upper lobe, 16 millimeter nodule, and hypermetabolic 3.2. This is starting to scream you know, cancer already, right? So this sounds to me like a high risk, okay? Why? Inherent risk factors for the patient and the radiologic characteristics of the lesion. So if we plot it using different models, you're going to get different numbers. And as you can tell, this one, yellow, 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 will tell you get more information. The red ones will tell you this is likely to be cancer, intervene, okay? Um, probably, again, since you have PET-CT already, Herder, treat a BIMC is probably the best, okay? Ended up being a non-small cell carcinoma. Third patient is 54 years old, active smoker, 58 pack years, emphysema, spicolated nodule, 14 millimeter, millimeters, SCV max 12. This is cancer to prevent all the ones, right? This looks high, high, high risk. Well, the models that you use actually matter. Same thing again. This looks very similar to this, right? So the ones that do not include the PET-CT fare um, or were not as good. And last one, 72-year-old lady, active smoker, 75 pack years, history of emphysema, six millimeter right upper lobe, found on low dose CT for lung cancer screening. All right, this one's really interesting because this is honestly what, what I've been dealing with a lot in the last couple of years. Depending on which one you use, you're gonna get different you know, paths. If you use treat, 
it's probably inappropriate because it doesn't even have a PET CT yet. Okay, um, tells you it's high risk. Okay, and you would send the patient for treatment, surgery, SBRT, or something. If you use any of the other models, it would tell you to monitor, or sorry, to get more information, or do something else, biopsy something. But if you use the most appropriate model for this case, it would tell you just watch it. Okay, why do am I saying is the most appropriate? Because Brock model was created using patients for lung cancer screening. So that is the most appropriate model to use for that specific patient. Okay. Uh, this actually, if you plot it into lung rats, you know, chart is a lung rats three and all you need to do is a cat scan in six, six months. Okay. So um, bottom line, use the appropriate model for that specific patient. Uh, this is a condensed chart and I've underlined what I think it's really important. Uh, if you have incidentally found low to moderate risk, use Mayo. It's the most well-validated. If you have a patient uh, with a PET-CT, use Herder. Herder is essentially Mayo model plus a PET-CT is the same. Very high risk, uh, use the VA model or the Gurney model. And then if you have a lung cancer screening CT uh, nodule, uh, use a, uh, the Brock model. All these are available online and you can easily find them. So, all right. So how likely is it to be cancer? We've, we've talked about models. So a lot of people will tell you, well, you know, the expert assessment or the clinician assessment is as good as models, right? And this has been studied. So they've compared Mayo versus expert, Mayo versus VA model versus expert and so forth. And the AUC for all of them is quite comparable, right? So in reality, and in this study, actually, it was better. So this was, this were models and this were physician uh, assessment. Okay. So expert clinical assessment is probably the same or perhaps even better than probably models. And I'm not surprised to read that because the same, you know, uh, variables that you put into a risk model are the ones that you're assessing as a clinician, right? You're talking about, you're assessing age, uh, smoking history, location, size of the, you're assessing the same things. The question is though, what is an expert? And I post myself that question, and am I an expert in the management of lung nodules? And there's no way for anybody to tell you that. So uh, I've heard the 10,000 hour rules, right? So I'm being a little bit funny here, but you know, I worked eight hours a day, five days a week, 48 weeks a year, 1900 hours. Uh, that means that uh, it is gonna take me about five, point, five years and roughly two, three months to become an expert, which means that I'm not yet, because I've only been practicing for four and a half years. So. Um, I'm making light of an important point, which is uh, if you have any hesitation about the probability of cancer in this particular patient, use a probability model and see, see if that helps you a little bit, okay? So summary predictive models are comparable to extra physicians uh, when, when evaluating the probability of cancer, um, but predictive models are tools and as such that should be used in the right situations by an experienced operator and in the right patient, okay? All right, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit and just have one or two slides about benefit and harm, okay? Definitions matter. Uh, benefit is the difference in outcome between a, patients that have the disease. One gets the treatment, the other one does not get the treatment. Okay, that's benefit. Harm is different outcomes between the same patients who do not have the disease. One gets the treatment and the other one does not. And a treatment must result in a complication or a side effect to you know, that has an adverse impact for it to be harmful. What this definition tells us is that someone who does not have the disease cannot benefit from something. They can only potentially be harmed. And someone who does not have the disease, uh, I'm sorry, and someone who has the disease can benefit um, uh, from the disease, from, from the treatment that you're uh, offering the patient, okay? Um, the point that I'm trying to make is that you have to make an assessment between the risk of harm and the risk of benefit in that specific patient. So I'm gonna take two same lesions in different patients, and we're gonna to try to figure out why this matters. In this box, we have a 58-year-old man, good ECOG, functional status, great PFTs. Screening CT shows peripheral 11 millimeter right upper lobe speculated nodule, no comorbidities. The patient himself is a low harm risk because the likelihood of a complication that has an adverse effect on them is low. 
And the potential benefit on that specific patient is high because the lesion seems high risk to be malignant. Okay, so that's a low harm, high benefit situation. If you have such situation, when the harm is low, even an intermediate probability uh, may sway you towards more aggressive therapies. Right? On the other side, in the other box, you have a 75-year-old man, ECOG is 3, FAV1 is 1.1, same lesion and many comorbidities. This is a potentially high harm situation uh, with high benefit. So when the harm is high, a high probability of malignancy is needed to intervene because you don't want to put the patient at undue risk. So that's how you manage those two things, harm and benefit. All right, so we've talked about probability of cancer. You know, you determine low, intermediate, high based off of probability models or your clinician experience. And then you have benefits and potential harms to that individual patient. The other thing that it's important to be added here is the preferences, right? You may have someone who's very adverse towards just monitoring something that may sway you towards getting more information. You might have a patient that's very anti-procedures or anything invasive. So they may sway you towards just more monitoring. So that also goes into the equation. Once you put all those things into context, then you get a management threshold. And the way I envision this is just like goalposts, right? So if, if you're to the left of this, you're going to get serial imaging. If you're to the right of this, you're going to get surgery. And anything in between, we need more information because we can't really figure out yet what this is, all right? Management thresholds. Again, you've assessed, put pressure preferences, harm benefit assessment, and then you get this, right? Based upon the probability of cancer, you get this, which is an observation threshold and a surgical or treatment threshold. I'd like to call it treatment threshold. If a patient falls in this area here, you just watch. You use one of your uh, uh, charts for Flashner, uh, whether it's solid or subsolid, and you watch it, you know, three, six, you know, 12 months, whatever. If you're in this category, in this space here, then the probability of malignancy is so high that you need to intervene, okay? And then you have a discussion with the patient about surgery or SBRT. Those are treatment options, right? And then anything between, you get transthoracic CT-guided biopsy. You get a PET-CT if you haven't had that yet. You get a bronchoscopy for biopsy. And then in the future, and I'm really excited uh, to mention this and for what's to come in the next few years, it's radiomics and biomarkers. Biomarkers are liquid biopsies. When you have a nodule, then a liquid biopsy, uh, and that's a separate topic in of itself, but may, may increase or decrease the risk of malignancy. And same thing with radiomics, essentially like a radiographic biopsy. I'll have a little bit more on this later. All right. So again, if you fall in this category, you watch. Here you get more information. All right. And here you treat. Now, we've talked about the risk to the patient. Right? So if a patient is adverse to risks, then you may move the thresholds. Example, the patient is a very high risk because of comorbidities. Then this gets pushed a little bit more this way, right? So even though the probability of cancer is high, you may still want to confirm with a biopsy or some more information before you submit the patient to the risk. On the other side, you may have a patient who's very healthy and they are adverse to watching it and they just want it out. So then you move this goalpost a little bit more to the left even though the probability of malignancy may be 60 or 61%, you may still send the patient for surgery, okay? Same thing goes here. Um, a patient may be right here where you just have to watch it, but then they're kind of adverse to that. So then you move the goalpost a little bit more to the left and you get more information. That's how you use this, okay? All right, and I say not surgical, I say treatment because you can also do SBRT, right? Okay, so, so what now? Easy things. If you have a screening nodule, follow long rights version 1.1. I have it here for reference, but it's not something to memorize. Just go and take a look at it. Any nodules less than 8 millimeter really need anything to just follow Fleischner 2017. And for anything else, let's keep the right. Enjoy the right. So this is long rats um, here for your reference again. This is Fleischner for solid nodules. And this is for subcellular nodules. So you can go back and take a look at those. But as you can tell, less than eight millimeters, you really need to do anything, right? Except radiologic follow-up. All right. Now we get to the chest guidelines for management of long nodules. And 
when I when I see this, I I stop caring about a you know a talk or something. But in reality, you guys already know about this. All right, we've already done this. So you have a nodule that's eight to thirty millimeters. Perfect. More than thirty millimeters is a mass, so it doesn't matter. It's a different thing. Less than eight radiologic follow up. So that's it. So anything in between needs something. Okay. So we've assessed the surgical risk and the inherent risks to the patients. We've already done that. Okay. And then you've already said the risk is low to moderate or the risk is high. And let's go here. You've already assessed the probability of cancer, right? Predictive models or experience. You have already, you're already able to tell, okay, this is a low risk patient, low to moderate. And then the risk of malignancy is either low, moderate, or high. If it's low, we know. Watch it, right? If it's low to moderate, that intermediate category, you need more information. And that more information could be a PET-CT, and in the future, actually more present, could be radiomics, you know, CT-guided biopsy, um, uh, liquid biopsies, things like that. And based upon the results of that, then you decide, okay, I need to, you know, take this for surgery or not. If it's a patient with high risk, we know now that we technically we don't need more information. We take the patient for treatment. The PET-CT recommendation here is for stage and purposes, okay? Not for diagnostic purposes, okay? Just in case the patient has diffuse metastases, okay? If the surgical risk is high, well, then that may just push us towards surveillance. If the patient's too high risk, just watch it. Um, or you may go with a biopsy. You're not gonna commit the patient immediately to surgery if they're high risk, right? You're gonna get more information. So we know this, we know what to do with this. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about PET. And this is where the, the talk gets a little confusing, I think. Uh, chest guidelines do tell you if you have between, uh, if you have a nodule more than eight millimeters, intermediate probability, uh, suggest so getting a PET CT. And that's good, right? Because the sensitivity is variable, 72 to 94%. If you, if you grab a lot of studies and you combine it, it's somewhere about 82, 81%. The problem with this is, Nobody can really tell you what's a positive PET scan, right? You read a PET scan and it doesn't tell you it's positive. It tells you there is faint uptake uh, with an SUV max of 2.7. And you're like, well, what does that mean to me? Okay. These studies, none of them, uh, I should say, these studies are not standardized for that. Some of them, so one may tell you, for one, the positive may be an SUV max of 2.6 or 2.5. For a different one, it may be faint uptake. So you don't know. It's not standardized. That's the issue. If you use an SUV max of 2.5, which is what's generally used, these are the numbers that you get. Okay. As you can tell, these numbers are all scattered. And then I get confused. I don't know why. If you look a little bit deeper, the reason for that is because the performance of the PET CT is affected by the pretest probability of malignancy in that case and the size and the characteristics of the nodule. Example, purely ground glass nodule. A PET CT is useless for that, right? Unless the solid component starts growing and growing, then the PET CT is a lot more helpful. Less than eight millimeters, useless. The, the ability to give you FDG uptake there is limited, so it's not helpful. And the pretest probability of malignancy in that specific patient, that's really important. And I'll, I have a nice slide on why that is important. So how does the pretest probability affect the PET CT? We're gonna start with the easy one first. We should just focus on the intermediate risk. By guidelines, intermediate is where we should be using it. You get a PET CT in this patient, you know, probability of malignancy is somewhere about 30% or so. You don't, you need something to sway you one way or the other. If it's positive, then the positive predictive value of that is 87%. If it's negative, then the pre negative predictive value is 83%. So it actually helped you, it helped you a little bit. Let's take the high probability. If this patient is likely to have cancer, all right, high probability, you run a PET CT and it's negative, all right? The negative predictive value of that test is very limited. Essentially what it's, what's telling you is that it's not truly negative, all right? Because the probability of malignancy is so high, it doesn't matter. This is why we don't use a PET CT for diagnostic purposes of this nodule in someone in a high risk category. On the other side, you take the low, you run a PET CT, and it comes back positive, but the pretest probability is very low. Then the negative predictive value of that test is very lim is, is, sorry, the positive predictive value of that test is low. It's only 66%. An example would be a 
I don't know, 35 year old man went to, I don't know, Arizona and comes back and they have fever, cough, and a nodule, solid nodule in the right upper loop. It's likely to be coxy. You run a PET CT, it's going to be positive. But is it malignancy? No, it's not. This is the reason this low positive predictive value and this low negative predictive value is the reason why we don't run PET CTs on high or low probability cases, okay? Intermediate ones. That's where it's most helpful. And even in intermediate, there's a significant false and you know, negative and positive rate, right? All right, so that's PET. So e another thing you can do when you need more information is to get a biopsy, right? You can do it transthoracic or bronchoscopic, and that depends on the size of the nodule. The larger the nodule is, the easiest. The location of the lesion, uh, the more peripheral it is, the most difficult it will be to get to it uh, bronchoscopically, although things are changing actively. Uh, the more central it is, the easier it is for a bronchoscopy to get to it. Bronchus sign is when the bronchus ends right on the lesion and you can see it on the CAT scan. That increases the yield of a bronchoscopic biopsy. The risk and benefit assessment of each strategy. Example would be, you know, someone who has had pneumothoraces on the ipsilateral side, then a CT guided biopsy, which has about a 20, 25% pneumothorax rate is higher risk for that patient. Uh, the expertise of the operator and the need for additional procedures. Example, uh, if uh, someone has a two centimeter nodule and you also need to do EBA staging, um, then you would take them for a bronchoscopic procedure because you can do two things at once as opposed to multiple procedures. Um, just briefly about image guided bronchoscopy, what I mean by that is robotic, um, navigation guided, radial EBUS. Um, this does not include robotic, and this data is, you know, from the 2010s uh, and 2000s decade. So it's very old. But overall, there's the yield of all these things. It's somewhere about 70, 72 percent. Newer data suggests that we're reaching 80. This is in flux, and with robotic bronchoscopy, the numbers may be significantly higher. Okay. Um, but conclusion is guided bronchoscopy for peripheral no lung nodules offers reasonably high diagnostic yield with low side effect profile, and they're recommended uh, on guidelines. Uh, the yield is best if the lesion is larger and you have a bronchosign. Um, that's it about bronchoscopy. Um, robotic bronchoscopy for peripheral lesions. Uh, this was the first study on that. Uh, it was a prospective multicenter. Uh, safety and feasibility study, the primary endpoint was su successful localization of the lesion, not the yield, all right, and then the complications. Important things from this study, um, the ability to reach the lesion was very high, okay, uh, it was 74% the ability to reach the lesion, um, not the diagnostic yield, and the pneumothorax rate was very low, 3.7%, so those are the things that that I think we can take out of this uh, paper. And there's a lot more uh, data coming out in the next couple of years. Uh, we expect the yield for robotic bronchoscopy for peripheral lesions to reach uh, mid eighties at least. Um, all right, so now you would ask, well, do we go, you know, if you have a patient who's moderate or high risk, do you sample them or do you go straight to resection, right? Um, this was an interesting study using only radiologic information, all right? Um, they stratified basically category one through five based upon how likely it is to be malignant done by an expert radiologist. Um, and then they figure out what happened with those patients. Uh, the important things here, if you look at category four and five, which are likely to be malignant, the, um, out of 36 for category four, only one was benign. And out of 87, only one was benign for category five. So what that tells you is that even from a radiological standpoint, if something is suspected or likely to be malignant, you can probably go straight to resection, all right? Uh, and category four and five for subsolid nodules or part solid was 100%, okay? So let's talk a little bit about resection. We're, we're not surgeons, but we need to understand what, the, what is it that they do when we send a patient for resection? Generally speaking, there's lobectomy and there's sublobar resection. Lobectomy is lymph node dissection and removal of the whole lobe. That's the gold standard. And sublobar re resection can be mean multiple things, right? It can be a wedge resection. They don't take a look at the nodules, uh, nodes. 
it could be a segment, an anatomical segment without the exploration. It could be an anatomical segment with lymph node exploration, or it can be an extended segmentectomy, which is the segment that's affected, the adjacent segment, and then they explore the lymph nodes. They've compared extended versus lobectomy for early stage lung cancer, and the five-year survival is very similar. And it's not surprising because they're taking a look at all the lymph nodes, right? And that's, that's the key, all right? Why do surgeons try to do sublobar resections compared to lobectomy? Because they're comparable uh, in outcomes, uh, and the operative mortality also favors sublobar resection. So it's 0.5 versus 1 to 4%. Um, um, and their survival is quite similar. All right. But talk to your surgeons. Uh, try to figure out what is it that they do. Are they doing just wedges? Are they doing anatomical segmentectomies? Are they taking a look at lymph nodes? Things like that. All right. Hey, Dr. Peralta, but what about, what about SVRT? We keep hearing about that. That stands for serotactic body radiation therapy is high dose radiation in fewer intervals. So it's usually about five, five days, I think, uh, but high doses and localized to the area of interest. Um, they've studied SVRT for inoperable biopsy, for inoperable, inoperable early stage lung cancer. The three-year tumor control, and I put that in quotations, is 97%. The reason why I put it in quotations is because it's not cure, right? When you do radiation to an area, that area is going to be fibrotic later on, may have radiation-induced pneumonitis around it. So you can't really tell if the lesion is there or not. If you guys have a tender tumor board, you will see that post-SVRT patients may even have positive PET scans. You don't know if tumor is there or not. But it's not growing. And that's what they mean by tumor control. So early stage, inoperable, non-small cell lung cancer post-SVRT, 97% tumor control. The three-year disease-free survival and overall survival are not that, are not the same. And that's something worth uh, noting. If you compare three-year overall survival of SVRT versus surgery, it always favors surgery. But if you're talking about tumor control, then it's very comparable. But what about biopsy-proven or empiric SVRT? What I mean by that is, very high risk patient, high probability of being cancer. And it's so high risk patient that you don't even want to put the patient through a CT guided biopsy or a bronchoscopy because they're not going to do well. Can we justify empiric SVRT? And the answer is yes. Okay. This was a study that did exactly that. They looked at patients with high probability uh, biopsy proven and high probability non-biopsy proven, uh, likely to be early stage non-small cell lung cancer, and then they followed it. For local, regional, and distant metastases, the numbers were very similar. So these are the curves, that one, that one, and that one. And this one is for death, okay? So as you can tell, it's very likely. What this means for clinical practice is that when you think the probability of cancer is exceedingly high in a very high-risk patient, you should consider presenting this case a tumor board because they might be okay for empiric SVRT. So um, we're almost done couple more slides. So how well do we use these guidelines? The answer is we don't do well. Um, they looked at exactly that. This was like a, a, a large uh, assessment, thousands of uh, physicians. Um, whenever you have a probability of cancer of less than 5%, the guidelines would suggest just monitor, right? Get a CT for surveillance, but only 48% of the cases we do that. And 52% of the cases were more aggressive. We're using a PET CT or a biopsy even in 12%. This is concerning to me, right? Because we've already said low probability of malignancy. You run a PET CT. The positive predictive value of that is very low. You should not be trusting it. This means that if this patient with low probability has a PET CT that's positive, you may be sending those patients for surgery. You did not need to do surgery on those patients. On the other side, it takes 60%. It should be 65, but they did 60%. I'm not sure why. Uh, Concordantly, it would be sent for surgery, right? But only 25% of the patients were sent to surgery. Most of them had something else, a PET CT, a biopsy. Again, big problem, right? High probability of malignancy, PET CT, the negative predictive value of this is not very high. So I'm concerned that a lot of these patients actually have cancer and they've been pushed in a different uh, uh, direction. So we don't use it very well. Um, so now we know how to do this, right? Um, then one slide, this is the only slide that I had found as of mid 2021 regarding the harm to patients, uh, that are undergoing, um, workup for lung nodules. Uh, and this was only, uh, 
uh, for long cancer screening. There wasn't anything for just regular nodules. Uh, and basically what they did is they asked patients, what do you perceive as a benefit and what do you perceive as a harm? Um, most patients think of radiation as a harm. That's contrary to what the physicians think. We think radiation would be good as it's a form of treatment. Um, Overtreatment is uh, interestingly seen as a potential harm in a significant proportion of patients, about 65%, okay? This was just interesting. Uh, routine screening, they see it as a benefit, uh, reduced death, obviously, um, and then invasive procedures, they do see it as a potential benefit. So this just sheds a little light on what we perceive as good things and bad things for patients and what patients actually perceive. A um, couple mentions on radiomics. Um, basically, it's integrated in vivo imaging with large scale gene expression profiles using um, artificial intelligence. And this can be used for diagnosis, staging, prognosis, therapy, response assessment, and things like that. And I'm going to oversimplify something that's extremely complicated, but uh, just so you guys are aware, because this is coming, this is the present and future. Basically, what they do is they grab thousands of images and they build a repository, a repository, and then they match your specific patient, and then they try to figure out, you know, does it have radiologic characteristics that would imply this is likely to be malignant, okay? You get the CT, then you segment, uh, you use image segmentation uh, to define the region of interest. What I mean is they're not evaluating the whole cask and they just evaluate the region that you think it's important. Then they extract the features and then they give you an analysis, okay, comparing it. And that can be used in the future to decide, okay, this is likely to be malignant or not. And this is not, you know, something of the future. It's actually current. It's been used for lung cancer histology, um, uh, micropapillary pattern within adenocarcinoma to look into um, uh, molecular phenotype um, and then radiologic features associated with a specific mutation. So it's, it's really interesting. All right. So... Um, so what now? We've, we've done this. I think we've covered most of it. We assess the risk of malignancy. We add it with the patient preferences, our assessment of harm and benefit. And then we plot the patient somewhere in the on either side of this goalpost, either treat or watch or something in between. And we know what the something in between is. Uh, we can use radiomics, liquid biopsies, biopsies, PET CTs, and things like that. Okay. All right. So uh, to close up, I'm going to present just a case and figure out what, what I think um, should be done, all right? Uh, and you know, normally I would ask a show of hands and unfortunately we can't do that. So after reading the, the question, I'm just gonna give a few seconds for people to internally figure out what they would answer. So uh, you were asked to review a screening low dose CT uh, for a 58 year old lady. She has a 45 pack year history of smoking, still active, have a pack per day was recently started on inhaler therapy for dyspnea, for COPD. Uh, which of the following models would be most appropriate to assess the risk of malignancy in this patient? And if someone wants to volunteer an answer in the chat, that's great. All right, I got a Brock here, Brock. Right, and, and I like that answer. Uh, the correct answer is Brock. Um, and the rationale for that is that this patient is not an incidentally found lung nodule, is a low dose CT for lung cancer screening purposes. So the prevalence of malignancy in this particular patient is lower than what it is in other models. So if you're gonna use one, you should use the appropriate one, with, in this case, Brock. You can also say, you know, who cares? I, I don't need one, I'm an expert, right? That's fine. So I actually did this. This is an actual patient, uh, 58 years old, emphysema, yep. Nodule size 12, solid, uh, upper lobe, yep. No, uh, no speculation. The probability that was given to me was 18%. So that's the info we got, 18%, okay? Second question. You are asked to review the screening CT of the same patient. Um, uh, she's 45, pack your history, smoking, active, have a pack per day, recently started inhaler therapies. What is the best next step? This is all you get. And I'll take 
answers. You want to go to clinic to talk about risks. Uh, you're going to get a diagnostic contrast enhanced chest CT or a PET CT, refer to thoracic surgery, repeat low dose CT, or review old images. All right, so I got a review of all the images. Two people are saying that. Any other takers? All right, so the right answer is, I believe, look at all the images. First of all, what category is this? This is a 11 millimeter. I think this ends up being like a 4A. Uh, yeah. Um, 4A, it's more than six millimeters uh, nodule. So uh, the risk of malignancy is somewhere about five to 15%. It makes sense with the Brock model. We uh, assessed it to be about 18 um, radiologic follow-up, okay? But the, the good answer is review old images. And that's what I did with this patient, okay? I was reviewing this chart. And then, so we got February, 2021, and then we got February, 2019. And then there's a little blip there. Right, so it was there before, and now it's that. So now the question is, um, again, you're asked to review the CT, the same patient, the nodule is 12 millimeters, uh, minimal cavitary component, you can't see it because of the arrows. Um, and it was non-solid six millimeter two years ago. So it was there six millimeters, it's now 12. What do you wanna do? What's the best next step? You wanna go to clinic? You want to get a CT dynamic, um, PET CT, thoracic surgery, or repeat the CT? All right. Chris says clinic visit. Anybody else? That seems very high risk to me, right? And... Why not send them to surgery? Why not take a biopsy? I wish this was live or in person. Yes, uh, John says PFTs first. And I agree, we just don't have enough information, right? Um, we don't know if this patient is high risk or low risk for surgery. Uh, there's nothing here that tells me, um, hey, I think this patient is gonna tolerate surgery. And more importantly, you haven't even talked to the patient. You know, you haven't gotten their preferences. Uh, what if they tell you, you know, I will never have surgery for this stuff or something like that? You know, you need to assess the patient preferences. So you've, you've got your risk, all right? Um, and now you need the patient preferences and potential harm and benefits. So clinic visit, all right? So what was actually done though? Because <laughs> by the time the patient got to me, they already had all this information. What was actually done was a PET CT, all right? And this poses a problem right? Uh, I believe without the PET CT, this is high risk, right? So if this gets a PET CT done and it's not avid, then I think it's falsely reassuring because the likelihood of malignancy is very high, all right? So I don't think a PET CT would actually be useful. Uh, that said, I think it ended up being positive. Uh, so the next step, again, is go to clinic, talk about risks, um, and figure out what do you need to do. All right. Uh, and I think that's it. Now we'll open up the floor for questions if you have any. So Mike is asking if a PET CT would be helpful for staging. Absolutely. For staging purposes, a PET CT would be indicated uh, as in pre-surgical or pre-treatment, pre-SVRT, uh, PET CT, but not necessarily for uh, diagnostic purposes. Um, and the point that I was trying to make with that slide, I'll bring this up again, uh, is this. So if... Um, 
you have a patient with a 12 millimeter nodule right upper lobe um, that's growing, right? So one of the other things that the uh, prediction models don't include is time, right? Those are all just one picture in time. It's not a continuum. None of the prediction models say, you know, growth or VDT or something. Now you have a little bit more information in this case. And although it's only a 12 millimeter right upper lobe in the screening CT, now you know that it was there two years ago. So the risk of malignancy just shot up so high that it's beyond 65%. So if we think of that patient with a 65% probability of malignancy, it's right here. If we run a PET CT and it's negative, the likelihood of that truly being negative is low. So it can potentially sway you towards watching something that should be resected or intervene upon. That's the point that I'm trying to make. But yes, for staging purposes, you do need it, not for uh, diagnostic. Yep, that's that's exactly what, what we're talking about, Mike. Agreed. Any other questions? All right, I'll stop sharing now. Uh, All right, thank you so much, Dr. Peralta. I think we're Absolutely. good. Perfect, thank you so much.